for this first day of the week, <clears throat> this time that we can gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and to lift up your high and holy name, encourage and exhort one another, and remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And it's his sacrifice and his resurrection that we have our hope in, that we can know that if we are obedient to you and are faithful unto death, that you will give us that crown of righteousness and that someday we will spend eternity with you. Father, we're mindful this morning of all those that we know that are suffering from illness and sickness and injury. And though we may not call every single one of them by name, we know that you know their needs. But we humbly approach you in prayer, asking you in faith to heal them if it be your will and restore them to their much wanted health. But Father, we acknowledge that it's not our will be done, but yours that we are obedient to you, that we ask you, hoping that in faith, that if it is your will, you will heal them. 
For those, Father, that are <clears throat> grieving the loss of their loved ones, whether it be yesterday or the last week or even years past, we pray that they would seek your comfort, that they would look for you, and that they would not turn away from you in their time of loss, but they would turn towards you. And that we as Christians, we as members of your kingdom, those of us that are members of the body of Christ, that we would reach out to them, that they could see that they are cared about, that they are loved, but also, Father, that we could see the opportunity not only for ourselves, but for those around us that this life is but a vapor, that we're not promised tomorrow, that we should not put off today, put off until tomorrow what could be done today, and that being, Father, being obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're mindful, Father, of this nation and the turmoil that it sits in. We pray that the leadership, not only of this nation, but this state and even this small community would seek your wisdom and guidance and the decisions that they make and that they would say and do those things that would preserve freedom and allow liberty to prevail and that we could continue to assemble and worship you in spirit and in truth. And for those men and women this very hour that are putting their lives on the line to defend that freedom, we pray your protection around them, that they could return home to their loved ones and those in times past that have given the ultimate sacrifice to buy that freedom for us, that we could continue to worship you as you have instructed us. But Father, we thank you most of all for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross of Calvary to purchase our pardon from our sins and allow us to stand holy and righteous before you. And when this life is over, we can stand before you and you can say, well done, my servant, enter into your rest. Father, we thank you for your word that we can open up we can read, we can understand, and we can obey. And we can also share with those around us. And help us to realize, Father, that unless we share the gospel, there are people around us that will never hear the truth. And the responsibility is laid upon our shoulders to go out of this building, to go out into our communities and plant the seed of the gospel that it can bring forth fruit and bring forth a bountiful harvest unto you. Be with us in this time of study, Father, in this time of worship. May we glean some knowledge that could help us to be better equipped to labor in your vineyard and be faithful servants in your kingdom. Forgive us of our sins, Father. We fall short every single day of what you expect of us. We say things we should not. We leave things undone we know we should do. But we're thankful, Father, for the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse us from all unrighteousness and allow us to stand holy and righteous before you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let me do some swapping around here. Get things like they're supposed to be before I get started. One of these days, I'm going to get all this stuff figured out where it works the way it's supposed to. I think I got it. Right there. All right. Let me double check that. Good deal. We're ready to go. <clears throat> this morning, what we want to look at, be turning with me to Genesis chapter 45 as we get started. <clears throat> Genesis 45, we're going to drink, and I'll be ready to go. Genesis 45, we see where we know the story of Joseph. And how his brothers sold him into slavery into Egypt. How Joseph rose to the right hand of Pharaoh. How he fell whenever he didn't give in to Potiphar's wife. Thrown into prison. But he returned. Rose back to his prominence. And we see where famine came throughout the land of Canaan. And his own brothers who sold him into slavery. Head off to Egypt purchase grain to survive and their father Jacob at home he can't make that trip and they realize when they get there that the person that's going to make sure that they are able to survive is their own brother that they sold into slavery being Joseph and Pharaoh instructs Joseph to send his brethren back to Canaan with everything that they need in Genesis 45 verse 27 his brothers tell all the words of Joseph to their father Jacob 
which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. In verse 48, Jacob, or Israel as he is known, said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. This morning we want to talk about what we need to do before we die. We don't know when death is coming. None of us do. Just this past week, I got a wake-up call. Coming home from Lewisburg, and I see a car coming towards me. Now, she's still a ways off, but crossing a bridge, and all of a sudden she makes a hard right turn and just, boom, smacks a guardrail on the bridge head on. Picks the car up off the road, airbags deploy. Honestly, I didn't expect to find her alive. And the lady, fortunately, was able to get out and walk away. You and I don't know what the next second holds for us. Look with us at Psalm chapter 90 this morning. Psalm chapter 90. <clears throat> there about verse 10. The psalmist writes, he says, The days of our years are three score years and ten. That would be 70 for those of you that are doing math. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, being 80, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Death is a sure thing. It is going to happen. Look what Job has to say about death. Job chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Man that is born of a woman is few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Man that is born of woman, we think it's a long time. We think 60, 70, 80, 90 years sounds like a long time. But those of you in here know it passes by in a flash. I was telling the kids the other night, it doesn't seem like 27 years ago when we were at the football game, 27 years has passed since the last time we were at another state championship game. It seems like it was just yesterday. But the fact is, time flies by. It is like a flower, Job says in verse 2. It's cut down. You know, it just seems just last week we were planting a garden in the backyard, and now everything is withered up and cut down and thrown on the, thrown on the burn pile. What does James say? James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 14. Death is a sure thing. And in James 4, verse 14, the apostle James says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For the ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. Many times you said, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. That, that's not important today. I'll get around doing that. And then you never get around doing it. I don't care what the menial task is. Before you die, don't let that one thing that you don't get done be obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let that happen. Don't let that sneak up on you. And then finally, this idea of life is short, death is certain. Hebrews 9, in verse 27. Hebrews 9, in verse 27 <clears throat> the writer says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment, we all have an appointment with death. May not be today, may not be tomorrow, may not be for another 30, 40, 50 years, but we've all got an appointment with death. Make sure we are prepared for it before it gets here. Death, we think about as a bad thing, but actually death is a good thing. It was not good for man to live forever in a state of man in a state of sin and rebellion. That's why man was driven out of the garden. Remember Genesis chapter three, when Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden after they were told not to eat of the tree of the tree of life. Genesis three verse twenty seven. Whoa, twenty two and twenty four. I'm sorry, got ahead of myself. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us <clears throat> to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and also take the tree of life and eat there and live forever. 
Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to, the, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove the man out, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the trees of life. The earth is not man's eternal home. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 12. This is not our home. This is not where we're going to spend eternity. We sing that song, This World is Not My Home. Just passing through. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. This idea of this is not where we are intended to spend our eternal life. There's another place reserved for us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know <clears throat> that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Many times we can ride right through our own community. We can see old houses that have been here for 40, 50, 60 years. And what do we see? Dilapidated, fallen in. There's even houses that many times we saw 15, 20 years ago. They're not here anymore. Fire destroys them. Weather takes over. They fall in. They're gone. They're not there anymore. God says there is a place for us. And it's not this earth. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands. These bodies are not adapted to heaven. While we're there in Corinthians, turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. Oop, not Colossians, 15, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. Hmm, excuse me. Verse 50. More on that here. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. This body is full of corruption. This physical body is not what's going to end, enter eternal heaven. We saw back in Ecclesiastes where it said, the spirit returns to God who gave it. This is just a temporary dwelling for us. This old body gets worn out, it gets torn up, it hurts, things don't work like it should. It's temporary. This is not going to be our eternal home. It is not adapted for heaven. We're going to have a new body, though. Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. They're about verse 21. Paul writing the church at Philippi. And he says, who? Back up verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is even able to subdue all things into ourselves. We're going to be changed. We're going to have a heavenly spiritual body. Not what you see walking around right now on this earth. Also look at back at Philippians while we're there. Flip back to chapter 1. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. Paul's still writing the church at Corinth. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Death is a great thing for a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's gain for us. We get to leave behind this corruptible world. We get to leave behind this corruptible body. And we get to be with the Lord. But Paul says, for me to continue to live, though, is Christ. Why? Because Christ lives in us. He lives through us. And if we continue to live on this earth, we are still serving him here. It is more opportunity for us to go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ so long as we live. So whatever we intend to do must be done before we die. The psalmist talks about that. Psalms chapter 6. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 6, verse 5. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? There's no more praising God here on earth once we die. There's no more remembering God once we die here on earth. We'll be in his presence. 
But whatever we're going to do, we have to do it before we die here. Look at Ecclesiastes. Same idea. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with your might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You're going to work and serve Jesus Christ? You've got to do it before you die. You see, here in a few moments, we're going to talk about this idea of purgatory. You ever heard that term before, purgatory? It's an idea that our Catholic friends have come up with that once you die, there's things that you can do that you can redeem yourself even after death. Look at the question, though. There's three questions that are answered here in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. What? Whatsoever thy hand find to do. What is necessary to be done in this life? How? What are you going to do? When you find that purpose, and I'll give you a hint, that purpose is serving Jesus Christ. How do you go about doing it? Is it, I'm just going to show up and do my one hour in my pew on Sunday morning. <laughs> I've, done my, I've done my service to Jesus Christ. Could you imagine if whatever we do for a living, whether it's whatever, secular job, farming, you name it, being a parent, if we did it just one hour out of the week and said, I, I, I've done my part for one hour a week, <laughs> we wouldn't be very good at what we do, would we? No, we wouldn't. We are told to do it <clears throat> with our might. Act with all your strength, with all your heart. Put everything into it. Why do we do it? Probably the most important question in that verse, though. Why do we do what we do and the way that we do it? Why? Because there is no knowledge, there's no work, no wisdom in the grave where you're going. The state that we are now enjoying will be forever ended. This life's going to come to an end. You've got a deadline to meet. No work, no device. No knowledge will restore the dead sinner to the favor of God. We've talked a lot in the last few weeks about the rich, young, or the, the rich man and Lazarus. Look at Luke chapter 16. We want to gather an idea from that real quickly. This idea that we whatever we're going to do, we have to do it in this life. That once this life is over, we don't have a second chance to come back and do it over again. Luke 16 and verse 19. We've seen the story numerous times this past few weeks. So there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. A certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at the gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. <clears throat> and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in this lifetime receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, for that would come from thence. Then he said in verse 27, watch this right here is what we're talking about. I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one would went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Don't take one second for granted in this life to share the gospel with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family members. Don't wait for them to be sitting in your funeral to hear the gospel and then get offended by it. Now is the time. Because once you are dead and gone, you can't talk to them anymore. 
Now you'll hear people say, oh, I, I, I heard my, my mother or my father talking to me. They've been dead. No, they're not talking to you. Now you may recall things that they said. But there's not going to be an opportunity for them to speak to you from the grave. Because if there is, Jesus is a liar right here. The time to get the gospel seed planted is today. Don't waste a second of it. The rich man wanted to be a soul winner, but he waited too late. He wanted to save his brethren. Now and today are great words in the Bible. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, again about... We'll start at verse 1. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Verse 2, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, not, I'm going to wait till Christmas so all my family can be together and then I'll be, obey the gospel. Today, the question is asked, what are you waiting for? Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm just going to put that off, I ask you, what is it that keeps you from obeying the gospel? What's holding you back? What is more important than being obedient to Jesus Christ? Look at Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, about verse 7. Start at verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I have a hard time believing you're sitting here listening to me, whether it's in person or online, and you say, Ah, no, nah, that was all just a bunch of fairy tales. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he has all authority in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18 to 20? Do you believe that what he said for you to do is what you must do to inherit eternal life? If he had told you to jump off of a bridge to be saved, would you do it? Because I'm here to tell you, he never said anything about just accept me into your heart as your personal savior. He never said anything about say this little prayer and I'll add you to the church. He never said anything about uh, just just believe and three weeks later we'll baptize you and we'll bring you forward and vote on your membership. That's, that's not in the Bible. If someone's told you that, they've lied to you. Maybe not maliciously. Maybe that's what they've been taught all their life and they've been too lazy to read the Bible for themselves. Yeah, I said it. I said they were lazy. A lot of the confusion and disbelief in the religious world is laziness, not willing to study for yourself, wanting to be spoon-fed and have it handed to you on a silver platter. Microwave generation. Want it now, want it easy. We should make peace in this life with man and God. Relative to man, Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, verse 39. Matthew 22, verse 39, he says, you know what it says, but we'll look at it. Talking about the rich young ruler, or some of them that come to him, which was a lawyer, asked him, questioning him, tempting him, saying, Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. It's on you, first and foremost, to be obedient to God. Why? Because you love God. But the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I'm here to tell you. The greatest love that you can have for your neighbor is what? Hand him a box of food. 
Oh, that's great. It's great to do that. Greatest love you can have for neighbors, help them out with some project got going on? Yeah, that's good. The greatest love you can have for anybody is to tell them the truth about Jesus Christ. When you take the attitude of, oh, well, I know old Jimmy Joe, he, he goes over yonder to that Baptist church or the Presbyterian church, Methodist church, this it's just a good thing that he's going to church. And that's where you leave it. You don't love old Jimmy Joe too much. You really don't. How do you say that? They're, they're going to they're going to church. The big difference in just going and sitting in the church building and being added to the church that Jesus Christ shed his blood for, Acts 247. Big difference between those two. There's a lot of people that go to church. There ain't many Christians. <gasps> you can't say that. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. He said, wide is the path and broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way and few that find it. Even on the day of Pentecost, we talk about 3,000 obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. Do you have any idea how many people were probably in attendance on the day of Pentecost? I got news for you. A whole lot more than 3,000. We even see the religious leaders of the day who knew what the scripture said, who knew what the Old Testament prophesied to, and they could see Jesus right in front of them. And they wouldn't believe on him. They wouldn't obey him. Why? Because they were afraid of what everybody else would think of them or do to them. If you're sitting in a religious assembly this morning because of how you want to be viewed by other people, Friend, you're a hypocrite. If you are there because, well, that's where my grandbabies are at, and if I leave, even though I know what they're doing is wrong, I may never see my grandbabies again. You got your priorities all out of whack. You all love those grandchildren enough to set the example for them to say, what is being done here is not in accordance with God's will, and I'm going to take the initiative to be the example and be the leader in my family and leave this nonsense and go where I know the truth is being taught. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Man is full of excuses. Well, we'd be there, but, you know, we have blah, blah, blah. Listen, we can make excuses all day long. The rich, the rich man, guess what? He was out of excuses. Don't be caught like him. Love your neighbor enough to tell him the truth. Matthew 5, Jesus talks about that some more. Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, meaning coming to worship God, and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Brother, sister, friend, neighbor. If church hopping was an Olympic sport in the Petersburg area, we'd have a lot of gold medalists. Because there's some of you out there, and I know you listen to this stuff. Some of you listen just so you can get mad. There ain't a church building within 10 miles of here that you hadn't settled down in at some point in time. And then you run away from them. Why? Because you don't hear what you want to hear. There's some of you that have left the Petersburg congregation because you didn't get your way about something. And you've run off and hid at another congregation. I got news for you. Jesus is talking to you right here in verse 23. If you bring your gift to the altar, if you're sitting in your little church padded pew this morning, singing about, oh, how I love Jesus and I love thy kingdom, Lord, and blessed be the tie that binds, and you've got hatred in your heart for your brethren at another congregation because you didn't get your way with them and you ran away, Jesus says your worship is in vain. And if you don't make it right 
You say, oh, I'm just, I'm just going to run away from here, and I'm not going to give them a reason why I'm leaving. I'm just, they're just going to show up Sunday morning. We ain't going to be back there where we sat for 30 years in that same seat. You're a coward for one thing. I don't care how well respected you think you are in the community. Your worship is vain. And if you don't fix it today, because we're talking about today, and the death waits for nobody, you're going to answer for it on the day of judgment. And you think because, well, there's 50 blue million churches of Christ around here and I can just take my pick up and throw a rock and hit one. And I can go run and hide over there. Everything's going to be fine. And let me tell you something else to you elders and leadership of these other congregations. When someone from another congregation shows up at your door and you don't know why, that might be the time to start asking some questions. But no, you're too concerned about, oh, he has a lot of money. That'll go in our collection plate now. Elders, you're going to be held accountable to that too. Leadership, you're going to be held accountable to that too. Leave your gift at the altar. Don't you dare sit there and worship another minute knowing that you've got aught with your brethren somewhere else. Because God is not going to accept it. Finally, look with me at Isaiah chapter 59. <clears throat> Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Well, there is a solution to that. Sin separates us from God. There's no degree of how much sin is going to separate you from God. We talk a lot about the one unpardonable sin. What's the one unpardonable? There's got to be that one, just that real big sin that nobody can be forgiven of. I got, I'm going to tell you. I hope you're listening today because when you hear that, that statement made, oh, well, that, that, that sin against the Holy Spirit, you can't. You, let me tell you something. There is nobody in 2020 that is committing the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that was spoken of in the Bible. Oh, what are you talking about? Poor you, you ain't got no degree from nowhere. What are you talking about? The people back then, Jesus talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, they were saying that the miracles that Jesus was performing were from the devil himself. Last time I looked, Jesus is not physically walking around this earth anymore performing miracles. He's not raising people from the dead. He's not feeding 5,000 people with one loaf of bread and a couple of fish. He's not doing that. Now, what's that sin, though, that will lead us all to eternal damnation? Got news for you. I hope you're listening because today is the day that you've been waiting for to hear the answer to this question. You want to know what that sin is that will lead you to eternal death? It's the one sin you don't repent of. The blood of Jesus can forgive and wipe out any sin man can ever think of. But unless you repent, unless you are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, I don't care how many times you slip and fall and stumble and keep on getting back up. If you are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and you ask God to forgive you of it, He'll forgive you. But that one that you don't repent of, that's the one that he can't forgive. God is not going to forgive you if you don't repent and say, you know what? That was wrong, and I know I shouldn't have done it, and I'm going to try to work and do better. Look with me at Romans 6. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. Start at verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye healed yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were, past tense, 
You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. <gasps> doctrine is a bad word. That's legalistic. Then you better just throw your whole Bible out. God be thanked that though you were servants of sin, you were murderers, you were you cussed like a sailor, you were fornicating. I, I, we could sit here all day and talk about it. The fact is, you're not doing that anymore. You are not beholden to whatever that sin was. You are now servants, and you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Well, what's that doctrine? The gospel. Spineless Christians today, we don't want to hear about doctrine. That's just that's that's legalistic dogma. We want to hear about love of Jesus. Well, I'm sorry, but doctrine you have obeyed from the heart that was delivered to you, that is what has saved you. Notice verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Once you obey the gospel, you confess your belief in Jesus Christ, you repent, you turn away, you say, I'm done with that old lifestyle. And you are... Buried in the watery grave of baptism, having your sins washed away, you are no longer that servant of sin. You are a servant of righteousness. You are a servant of Jesus Christ. So I ask you the question this morning. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Why keep putting it off? Whether it be obey the gospel and become that servant of Jesus Christ or saying, I have obeyed the gospel, but I have fallen away. And I've been caught up too much in what my family wants or what my favorite preacher tells me I need to do. And I can't believe that I had somebody actually tell me in the last few weeks. That I know this is what the Bible says, but this is what my preacher's telling me. What? What? This is, I know what the Bible says, but here's what my preacher, if I hadn't heard it, I wouldn't believe it. What are you waiting for? Do you need to obey the gospel? Well, what does that mean? What must I do to be saved? You must hear the gospel, Romans 10. 17. You must believe it. You must repent. You must confess and be baptized and then live faithfully. What must I do to be saved? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Not your feelings. Not what mom and daddy told you or they've always believed. Not what your favorite preacher said. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Well, what are we going to hear? We're going to hear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we're going to hear what Jesus has said on the matter. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. You're not going to get baptized just for the sake of getting wet. You're going to be baptized because you believe that Jesus says who he was. And is, and you want to do what he commands. What must I do to be saved? You must repent. You must turn away from the world and turn toward God. Acts 17, verse 30, Paul in Athens, he says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, or he winked at it. He turned a blind eye to it. But now commends all men everywhere to repent. Turn away from the world and turn toward God. You must confess your belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Not coming confessing your sins as an alien sinner. No. Romans 10, 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confessing what? The same thing the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. 
They went down the road to came some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Where did he come up with that idea? It's because Philip had opened his mouth earlier in the chapter and preached Jesus with him starting in the book of Isaiah. And preaching Jesus involves telling people about baptism. And in verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may believe what? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God? How do you know that, Corey? Because the eunuch opened his mouth and answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just like when Jesus asked his disciples, he said, who do men say that we are? Well, you may be Isaiah, you may be Moses, you may be one of the prophets, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus told him, he said, flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. That confession, the faith in Jesus Christ that he is who he says he is, the Son of God, is the cornerstone of Christianity. That's where the church begins, is faith in Jesus Christ. And without it, it's all a bunch of hogwash. What must I do to be saved? The part that the majority of the religious world, for whatever reason, just cannot embrace. They hate it. They call you a bunch of Campbellites for it. Acts 2, verse 38. Peter said unto him, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, you've heard the gospel. You've believed it. You've confessed your faith in Jesus Christ. You have repented and turned away from the world. You've been baptized for the remission of your sins. Now comes the hard part. Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. What must I do to be saved? There it is for you. Have you done that? Well, I, I did what Granny told me to do 50, 70 years ago. She can't be wrong. You better be fact checking granny. We hear a lot of words, we hear a lot of talk in this day and age about fact checkers. It's time to be some fact checkers, folks. It's time to open the Bible up and fact check what our families, what our friends, what our favorite preachers have told us for generations and make sure that we've got the truth and not a bunch of fake news. You need to obey the gospel. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may very well be too late. If we can help you in any way, let it be known as we sing. Today is the day of salvation, tomorrow may be too late. And anger and death will be laid, except God's saving grace. His life on the cross he has given, don't come while yet you may.
<clears throat> Let's give thanks for the unleavened bread. Following this first day of the week, we gather together and remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that without his sacrifice there on the cross of Calvary, none of us could have a hope of eternal life with you. And it is for his sacrifice and your love and your grace and your mercy that you made it possible that we are eternally grateful and indebted to you. Father, as we gather together, we partake of this bread which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took that night that he was betrayed and he broke it and he gave it to those with him. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. As we partake of this this morning, Father, may we think back to those scenes of Calvary. Remember the great love that he had for us, that he endured that pain of those nails in his hands and his feet, the scourging, the whipping, the crown of thorns on his head, the humiliation he went through, and the abandonment that he felt. And he went through it because he loved us. Amen. Which in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Like manner, Father, we thank you for this cup, this fruit of the vine, which Jesus said was his blood that was shed for the sins of many for the New Testament, for the covenant, for the new covenant. We realize that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And Father, we are eternally grateful for that blood that he shed there on the cross of Calvary, that we could have our sins washed away and we could stand holy and righteous before you. May we take of this in a worthy manner. It's pleasing unto thee. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This time let us give thanks for all the many blessings we have had bestowed upon us in this past week. Following this first day of the week, we come before you acknowledging that everything that we have comes from you. And without you, we would be nothing. We're eternally grateful for the spiritual blessings that are found as members of the body of Christ. But we thank you also for the daily provisions that you provide for us. And without you, we would have nothing. That we trust in you and we put you first and all these things that men worry about, we can trust that it will be provided for us. May we give back unto you a portion that you have so richly blessed us with, that your work could go forward in this community and even throughout this world, that the seed of the gospel will be planted and a rich and bountiful harvest could be presented unto you. May we do so cheerfully, knowing that what we give here today is working for you and that one precious soul could be led to the truth. May we do so in a manner pleasing to thee. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As always, we thank you for being here today. For those that may be watching online, we encourage you to come and be with us in person. I promise you, nothing in this world is more important than worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And there's no exception, there's no substitution for being gathered together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So we beg with you, we plead with you. If you are in the area, you're local, come be with us. For those of us in attendance that know that there are those that could very well be here, 
It's time to reach out. It's time to say, what's holding you back? How can I help you? What can we do to help you be in the assembly of Jesus Christ? And let's remember what our mission is that Jesus has sent us forth to do. Preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because it's the greatest gift you can give someone. We're in a time of the year when we're talking about giving gifts when most of the time things that will be thrown aside within a few weeks and forgotten about. The greatest gift you can give a loved one is to preach the gospel to them. Why? Because if they believe it, it will lead to them being baptized for the remission of their sins. But if they don't believe it, they're eternally lost. And I promise you, 100% of the people that do not hear the gospel do not believe it. They may have heard a form of a gospel, but Paul says it's another gospel. It's not the gospel that we have preached to you. Let's make it a point to reach out to someone this week that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll sing this as our closing song. That's Brother Paul. This message. Thank you for good 
health. Pray for all that have health problems. Pray for their comfort. We have crude and restored health. It could be nice. Brother Father, let me know. Brother Felt Lord, Mr. Betty, you and Betty Crabtree, Father Peter. Father also, for David Adams, pray for his comfort and recovery. It could be out of him. Father, we pray that you continue to bless us. Garden guys, forgive us for any unforgiven thing. Christ will never pray. Amen. Amen.